Hello IB Biology students, this is Ms. Sheely with your next installment of our homework notes, video notes. Make sure that you are taking notes but also writing down any questions you have so that we can go over them when we return to class. Today's topic is 2.9 um, in your textbook, so chapter 2, section 9, and this is photosynthesis. All right, so the first thing we need to remember from ninth grade biology is that photosynthesis generates a chemical store of energy in the form of carbohydrates. So this is how plants and other autotrophs convert light energy in to a chemical energy. So we take the light from the sun and we use it to make a sugar um, and oxygen. So we actually have two different reactions that are used together. We have something called a light dependent reaction and they're going to use light energy to produce ATP and to split water to make hydrogen ions. And then those hydrogen ions will go on to the light independent reactions where we'll also use um, ATP to fix the carbon dioxide in the atmosphere um, that is taken into the plant and make glucose. So you can see here this carbon dioxides are going to go straight into the glucose when combined with the hydrogen ions. We're going to take the water and we're going to split the water using light. So that's a process called photolysis or light splitting. And the photolysis process is going to split the water into oxygen atoms that are released as gas and hydrogen plus ions. Those hydrogen plus ions, the carbon dioxide, and then some ATP that we also make in that first light dependent reaction that involves photolysis are going to be used together to make our, our glucose. Um, as I just said, we do get some oxygen as a waste product, and the glucose is either then stored for um, use later as a starch, such as in a seed, or it can be used immediately for respiration. When we get that glucose from eating a plant, we're actually getting the starch that the plant has stored for later use. All right, so remember um, back to our topics in October, starch and cellulose are both polysaccharide molecules that are found in plants. Starch is our chemical store of energy, and the cellulose is um, what is made to build the cell walls. So remember, just as a, rev a revision, the process through which monosaccharides combine to make carbohydrates, when you add a glucose plus a glucose, you get a polysaccharide, um, depending on how many glucoses you're adding together. Um, starch, in this case, has three glucoses, and your glucose is your repeating unit here. You can see one, two, three. All right, so that process in which we're linking the glucose and the glucose and whatever other monosaccharide together is called condensation. So in this case, we're linking two glucoses together. We're going to remove a hydrogen from the number one carbon and a hydroxyl group from the fourth carbon. Those two come together to make water and that bond that is formed with the oxygen in the middle is called a glycosidic bond. All right, so we're talking about plants and photosynthesis, or autotrophs and photosynthesis. But we also need to do some review from middle school, um, earth science, and the electromagnetic spectrum. So remember that all radiation has a frequency and a wavelength. Waves with low frequency are more spaced out, and um, so they have a longer wavelength. And waves with a high frequency are closer together, so they have a shorter wavelength. So here we have waves that are spaced out, so they have a longer wavelength, or space in between the waves. And then waves that are um, at a lower, at a higher frequency, have uh, wavelengths that are much closer together, so they are have a shorter wavelength. But you also have high frequency radiation, and this has many waves per unit time, therefore it has a lot of energy. 
UV, X-rays, and gamma rays are all harmful to living organisms because they encourage cell and DNA division. That's where we get skin cancer and tumors from. So if you're looking at the entire electromagnetic spectrum, you have gamma rays, X-rays, and those UV rays. And they are in the high frequency area, you can see this here, with smaller wavelengths. And these are all very dangerous. Next to them, and kind of in the middle, is where we have our visible light spectrum. Um, and so those are wavelengths that have a kind of a medium or average wavelength and have uh, average spacing. Low re frequency radiation is low in energy and uh, it's too low to actually be used in most living things. So we have infrareds and radio waves that would be used uh, would be low frequencies. So pigments and photosynthetic organisms such as chlorophyll absorb the useful waves of light and those are the ones that contain the energy that are appropriate for photolysis and the photosynthesis reactions or the light dependent reactions within the photosynthesis. Here you have a um, visible light spectrum with how much is being absorbed by the um, plant. So you can see you have more absorption in the purple-blue area, less in the green-yellow, and then more absorption again in the orange-red area. So this gives rise to the action and absorption spectrum that we need for or that we see in photosynthesis. So why does a leaf look green? Well, a leaf looks green because chlorophyll is the main photosynthetic pigment in plants. So remember that white light actually has all the colors or the wavelengths contained within it. The blue and the red wavelengths are absorbed, like we just saw here, blues and purples, oranges and reds, and the green light is actually reflected. So that is what our eye picks up. Um, anything that's being absorbed is not reflected out. So chlorophyll is a pigment. It's a chemical that changes color changes the color of reflected light. It is stored in chloroplasts, but by heating the leaf of an alcohol, the leaf in alcohol, we can actually release the chlorophyll. So we're still getting everything going in. We're still reflecting the green light, and we're able to see the blue and the red wavelengths absorbed. And we can use something called a spectrophotometer to measure how much absorption is being done by that chlorophyll um, pigment. So you have a couple of different spectrums. The first one you have is the action spectrum. This is the range of wavelengths of light which can be used in the light dependent reactions. So here on your x-axis you have the wavelength of light so and then um, above the line we also have it broken into colors. So remember your Roy G. Biv red Roy G. Biv, red, orange, yellow, green, blue, there's some indigo, and violet. So um, your wavelengths of lights, your blues actually have um, lower wavelengths, lower nanometers of wavelengths, and your orange reds have higher ones. And then on our y-axis, we're um, graphing the percent use of absorbed light, so how much of that absorbed light is actually used. And you can see that we are highest in the blue-violet, but we're also very high um, in the orange-red. The absorption spectrum, so here you have your action spectrum along the back, that's in the black line, that's what we just looked at. But now we're going to look at the absorption spectrum, and this is the, the colored line that you see now, and that's going to be graphed on the opposite y-axis. So this is the percent absorption of light. So you can see where our action where we're using the most absorbed light is also mirrored by the percent that is absorbed. So we're actually able to um, absorb a little bit on the green yellow, but we're not using hardly any of that. So the absorption spectrum is the range of, wa range of wavelengths of light that are absorbed by chlorophyll 
the photosynthetic pigment. So these are the ones that are absorbed, and these are the ones that are used. So how they're used, how they're absorbed. And then you can see them both here. The black line would be how they're used, and the colored line is how they're absorbed. All right, so oxygen. How do we produce the oxygen? So oxygen is really important for um, consumers, for heterotrophs. Um, we need to take that in for cellular respiration, and we can't do photosynthesis on our own. So we're going to use a process um, within photosynthesis called photolysis, um, which I already mentioned, to break the water molecules. So the sun's energy comes into the leaf hits the water molecule and then causes the water molecule that's been taken into the plant to break into um, oxygen ions that come together. So two oxygen ions come together to form O2, which then can be released as a gas. And then the hydrogen ions are able to be used within the leaf for glucose production. know photosynthesis well we have effects of photosynthesis we can see kind of some effects of photosynthesis on the earth so 3,500 million years ago prokaryotes started photosynthesizing on the earth and then many millions of years later we had algae and plants joining that process of photosynthesis how do we know that this is true well we have we can see a rise in atmospheric oxygen concentration and we know that that began about 2400 million years ago we know this because about 2200 million years ago there was a increase of two percent and time is our first glaciation event on earth so there's a correlation there that we have a 2% increase in atmospheric oxygen concentration occurring 2,200 million years ago, which was the same time as our first glaciation event. So this shows that there was a reduction in greenhouse effect. The increase in the atmospheric oxygen concentration means a decrease in atmospheric carbon dioxide. Think about it. Think about photosynthesis. If we're increasing the amount of oxygen in the air, it means we have a lot of photosynthesis happening. So there's a decrease in carbon dioxide concentration. Another thing that we know, another effect of photosynthesis on the Earth, is a rise in oceanic oxygen concentration. So this rise in oceanic oxygen concentration caused an oxidation of dissolved iron in the water. How do we know this? Dissolved iron precipitates onto the seabed. We can actually look at this precipitate. It formed a very distinct rock formation on the seabed. And these banded iron layers are really important to our current or um, iron ores. They are, are the majority of our steel supply. So we know um, or can deduce how long ago prokaryotes started photosynthesizing and how long photosynthesis has been happening because of the rise in atmospheric oxygen concentration that caused the first glaciation event and the rise in oceanic oxygen iron, banded iron layers on the ocean floor in the ocean floor. All right, so this is uh, kind of one thing that we're going to be exploring in our inquiry lab. These are the factors that affect the rate of photosynthesis. The first factor is going to be carbon dioxide concentration. So remember that photosynthesis is an enzyme catalyzed metabolic pathway. And as you increase carbon dioxide concentration, the rate is going to increase as well. You can see that our rate of reaction starts to increase almost at a, a nice steady rate. But at a high concentration, a further increase of carbon dioxide is not going to have any effect on the reaction because all the carbon dioxide is fixed or being used within the reaction at maximum efficiency. 
Carbon dioxide is actually the substrate when you're looking at it like this in the reaction. So the curve behaves as a typical substrate concentration curve. The enzyme that's doing the work for photosynthesis, in this case on the carbon dioxide, is Rubisco. So as all the Rubisco in the plant no additional carbon dioxide will bring a further increase because there's no more rubisco to use to turn that carbon dioxide into glucose. The next factor that affects the rate of photosynthesis is light intensity. So as you increase light intensity, we're going to increase the rate of the reaction, and it looks almost to be another nice steady increase. But once you get to a high light intensity, a further, in, further increase of light is not going to have any effect on the rate of uh, the reaction because all the chloroplasts are working as hard as they can. And when we say intensity, we're not talking about heat. This is the brightness of the light, but not with any heat to it. So think about a very dull light going up to a maximum very, very bright light, but you're not getting any heat. So think about when we're doing the leaf disc lab, um, we are looking, we're including um, the water bowl as a heat sink to um, absorb all that heat so that we're not um, actually um, denaturing our enzymes. All right, then the last factor uh, to affect photosynthesis all right, so the last factor to affect photosynthesis is going to be temperature. So we're still going to get, as temperature increases, we're still going to get the, the rate of the reaction increasing. But you can see it's not quite the linear, um, steady linear uh, increase that it was for the both carbon dioxide and the light intensity. It's a little bit closer to an exponential jump, but then you're going to reach an optimal temperature, and this is going to be an optimal temperature for the plant um, or for the chloroplast um, and the rubisco. And as that optimum temperature, once you're past that point, the enzyme will denature. So this is when you're increasing the heat. So once the enzyme denatures, the active site changes and it's not able to allow the function, the enzyme to function. So once you get past that optimum temperature, you're going to start to have a decrease as your enzymes are slowly denaturing and you get less and less enzymes that are able to work until you have no enzymes that are able to work and you have no reaction. All right, that's it for today's photosynthesis notes. So make sure you bring those questions to class and jot down your notes so that uh, we can check off on those and give you your good homework grade. Thanks so much, guys. Have a great day.